You're listening to a sermon from the Spring Midtown Church in Phoenix, Arizona. If you'd like to learn more about the Spring and its ministry, please visit thespringmidtown.org or follow us on Instagram or Facebook. you to turn on your screens, if you're open to turn on your screens, and turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah 6 is where we're at today. We're continuing our series, Hashtag Here, Now, Us. And uh, today we're going to be talking about finishing well. And I say that uh, in part because it's worth knowing that we're going to talk about finishing well, but also because we're not going to be done with the Nehemiah series. So just because we're talking about finishing doesn't mean that we're done with this book, but uh, yeah, Nehemiah finishes well. So that's what we're going to spend time talking about. So we're going to read at 6, start at verse 1. We're going to stop, and then we're coming back to this. So leave a a finger or a bookmark for this. Nehemiah 6. Now, when it was reported to Sanballat and Tobiah and to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had built the wall, and there was no gap left in it, although up until that time I had not set doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem said to me, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to come down to you? They sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sambalat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that's why you're building the wall. And according to this report, you wish to become their king. You also have set up prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you, There is a king in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these words, So come, therefore, let us confer together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hand. We'll stop there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm about to show you a video, and it will look like it's about a magician pickpocket. It's not. This is about distractions. I'll try this with you. Uh, So you have a few things on you right now. You have your watch, which doesn't come off very well, but your belt does. Do you still have your belt on at the moment? (laughs) Double check. (laughs) Yes, I do. (laughs) You have to watch close for these things. If you can do this for me for a second. Do What's in your front pocket? Do you still have their credit cards as well? Do you still have your credit cards? I do. Don't put your hands in your pocket. That's a different show. Just check the bottom of your pocket. Something over there on that side. I do, yes. All right, great. Just checking out of what you do have. It's hard to tell. Look at this guy. Sorry, guys. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Just let him my credit card. Just look at me. Just get rid of her. You didn't have a whole lot on you. What was the pen that you had a while ago? Did you put that in somewhere safe? You're right here. Okay, so that was harder to get to because of the microphone over the wire. Where was your wallet at? Uh, was that in the inside jacket here? Yes, it was. All right. Would you check to see if that's still there? But it's not there. <laughs> Willie? All right. So out of those items, just to make this fast, I believe the pen is gone, yes? <laughs> the pen is gone. The wallet is gone. <laughs> is the cash gone, sir? Uh, the, cat, the cash is gone, yes. Okay. Thank so you. I have a few things. Let's here's your credit cards, your IDs, and then those items as well. They used to Thank be in you. your pocket. And here's my favorite part. <laughs> and your wash, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I did not notice that. I swear to God. <laughs> you, all right, let me do that. I have something of yours, too. Uh, did you feel that? I did oh, not do feel Do you still that. have the wallet? It feels like I have something. Yes. Bring it up. Open it up. Is there something inside? It's, it's the pen. It's my pen. Open oh, up. Actually, uh, what's unusual about the pen, I had a little bit of extra time, so I did this. Here's the refill for the pen. Will you open up the cap for me for a second? <laughs> I think there's something inside. <laughs> no, no, no. Open that up. That's the uh, $100. That's $500. Wow. It's amazing how quickly distractions can rob you blind. I feel like those guys in that video all the time. All the time these days. There are plenty of distractions in the United States of America in a normal season. But during COVID, man, I feel like I'm going this way. And all of a sudden, there's a child screaming over here. And then... My wife suddenly needs to talk about something really important, and there's there's this real financial issue, and we've got to really think about this thing at work, and there's a problem with my car, and we probably have to be paying attention more to the news, and oh my gosh, there's an election coming up, and I really need to do a lot more reading, and I can't believe everything that's happening, and all of a sudden you think, 
Has it been a day? Has it been a week? Has it been a month? I'm losing so much so fast in the midst of all of these distractions. And I want to finish well. Finishing well is about getting to the end of your life and being the kind of person that you always wanted to be. It's about getting to the end of COVID and not feeling like you wasted six months, six years, however long this will be of our lives. It's about getting to the end of that newborn season with kids and really feeling like you embraced that season or getting to the end of an engagement season or maybe the time where your, your children are in high school and, and then in college and really feeling like you, you used that time well. But sometimes distractions just make us feel like it's flying by. And we all know people. We know people who get to the end of their lives and they say things like, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I wish I'd written that book I always meant to write. I wish I'd gone to that place I always meant to go to. I wish I'd been more intentional with my marriage. I, where did the time go? Distractions can rob us blind. If you want to finish well, you have to stay focused. Relentlessly focused. Nehemiah stays focused to the point that he sounds paranoid at the beginning of this story. I've been working on the wall, he says. It's done. I mean, there aren't gates in it, but it's done. And all of a sudden, these people, they want to meet with me in the, the villages of the plains of Ono. And I just didn't want to go because I thought they were up to no good. And you think, I mean, maybe they want to have a peace summit. Maybe they want to bury the hatchet. These are people who've been as enemies throughout the story, and maybe you're going to antagonize them by not going to this meeting. But Nehemiah sees any distraction as a threat. Any distraction is a threat to the thing that God has called him to do. Uh, this meeting that he's been invited to in verse 1 and 2 is down about a day's walk from Jerusalem. So at the very least, it's 48 hours of wasted time. And then who knows how long in the midst of these conversations. And so when he's invited to this meeting in the, the plains of Ono, he says, Oh no, I'm not going. I love that joke. It's not very good. But if the people who wrote this book had spoken English, I think they would have found it hilarious. Oh no, a distraction. I'm not going there. He is relentlessly on the lookout for distractions and refuses to move off the path that God has placed him on. At this church, we regularly talk about things like the purpose that God has for us in life. Because we believe that everyone has a purpose, whether you know it or not. And first and foremost, that purpose is that you would know the God who made you. That's everyone's purpose. But then specifically, you have been made for a purpose. Your spirit, your body, your mind, your psyche, all of it together, you are uniquely built for some purpose in the kingdom of God. And I don't know what it is, and maybe you know what it is, or maybe you're on the process of discovering it. And there are people who get to the ends of their lives, and they start asking those big questions about life, right? Like, why am I here? And what's the meaning of life? And what does happiness really mean for me? And what do I really want my life to be about? And maybe they ask those questions along the way, but sometimes we put off answering them for too long. So we don't lead intentional lives and we're constantly being distracted. Do you know that the average person spends 3.1 hours a day on a cell phone? That's pre-COVID. That's 25% of your waking life. Now, I know that rectangle is exciting and interesting. It's not that exciting. Not enough to spend 25% of your life looking at it. And again, that's pre-COVID. There are plenty of people who dive really deeply into video games in this season. But we never think of it as like, well, I spent six hours doing something. It's, well, I spent five minutes here and 20 minutes on YouTube there and, and seven minutes on Facebook there. We're nickeling and diming away our lives, away our attention. We're being distracted to the point, honestly, that we will cease to be the people that God has called us to be if we're not careful, if we don't stay focused, we will not finish well. There's a friend of mine in life who likes to talk about certain things as time vampires, and I just love that phrase. It just sucks life right out of me. He'll say, I picked up a new video game, and honestly, it was a time vampire, so I had to delete it. You know, I've been diving really deeply into this thing, and I don't think it's a time vampire yet, but I have to put some pretty clear boundaries on it. What are the time vampires in your life? What are the attention vampires? Where do you feel like you're being pickpocketed by distractions? The guy from that video before, his name is Apollo Robbins. 
He works regularly with clinical psychologists and neuroscientists to talk about the, the subject of attention and how if you can grab someone's attention, you can do pretty much whatever you want to them. Stay focused. Nehemiah does. The story continues at verse 10. One day, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehebbel, who was confined to his house, he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, they are coming tonight to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Would a man like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And then I perceived and saw that God had not sent him at all, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalit had hired him. He was hired for this purpose, to intimidate me and make me sin by acting in this way so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. There is a chorus of distractions in Nehemiah's life. Not one voice, but many voices. And they don't just speak once, they speak again and again and again. He's only given us the highlights, the kind of the worst moments. There are people we don't even hear about in the rest of the book. Who is Noadiah? What are these other prophets? We don't know. But we do know that for some reason he goes into the house of Shemaiah, maybe this religious leader in his life, maybe a mentor he respects, a guy who feels confined to his house. And as they start talking, the guy says, they're going to kill you. We've got to run. We've got to hide. And this is a perfectly believable threat. Absolutely. These people are enemies. They've already been slandering him in the press, doing everything they can to destroy this guy. And now they've moved on to really personal attacks, not just of his character, but they're actually going to try and assassinate him. Or, or so he thinks. And Nehemiah listens to this. Apparently his spiritual advisor, maybe some kind of mentor, maybe a priest or a prophet, we don't know who this guy is. And he starts to really think and discern and say, all right, that is dangerous. But should I really run away? Is that really who I am? Am I the kind of person who runs when I'm threatened? Do I want to let fear control my actions and who I am? I'm not going to do it. Don't let fear be the reason you don't do something. Now, obviously, this is within reason. We're not talking about skydiving, although maybe skydiving. I don't, don't let fear be the reason that you don't. That's, fear is a huge motivator for many of us. It's one of the reasons people don't try for a promotion at work. It's one of the reasons that well, people don't try to talk about Jesus in their day-to-day -day lives. Evangelism. For most of us, if we're honest, it's just because we're scared. We're scared to talk about Jesus. We're scared of what's going to happen if we fail. We're scared of what people are going to think about us if we're the kind of people who talk about Jesus on a regular basis. And it stops us from doing something that honestly might change other people's lives and might lead us into this remarkable place of seeing God's kingdom move among people we really love and adore. But fear is one of the reasons people don't work on their marriages. I have already in COVID seen casualties. It's only been a few months. Already in COVID I've seen marriages that are casualties of this pandemic and the lockdowns. And there are people who would say it's distraction, right? I just haven't been investing in this for a while, and we, we just kind of haven't been intentional in our relationship. But actually, it's been going on a lot, probably before COVID, and now it's just highlighting all of the issues, and suddenly we're seeing it. And I'm just, I'm afraid it's going to get worse before it gets better, and I'm too embarrassed to go talk to somebody about it and see a counselor, because that all sorts of stuff's going to come out. And I just, I'm going to hope that the problem goes away. I'm just going to hide from it. Don't let fear be a reason that you do something, or don't do something. Fear is a reason that people often feel like tithing is impossible for them. Our season of life was filled with fear. We can look at the news for about five minutes. You can doom scroll on your phone for hours. Just keep going down about all the terrible things that are going to happen. There's this election that's coming up. There's the coronavirus. There's the pandemic response. There's this official that's not doing well. There's this scheme that seems to be happening in society. And I'm just not sure what's going to happen. And honestly, I don't want people to die. I'm honestly, I don't want the economy to crash. And I'm very afraid I'm going to lose my job. And I just, I feel like it's, it's time to just, to hide. 
And Nehemiah stands his ground. And I think we need to stand our ground too. If you want to finish well, stand your ground. Stand your ground. Now let his question be your question. Should a person like me really hide? Am I really the kind of person who runs from fear and problems? Is that really what I want my life to be? Is that what I want the witness of my life to be about? Do I want to come to the end of this season and say, well, I was just too scared? We know that God has called us to do many things, right? Including loving our neighbors and our enemies and those sorts of things. And in a pandemic, right, something that already exists in our culture, this desire to only really care about the people I care about, to live as an individual and only really have people in my circle who matter to me. That was already a temptation, but the one you add this fear of disease, we go, yeah, that's just... Like, that's just a good decision. We have the best excuse in the world to live the way we are already told to live by our culture. And this is not to minimize COVID at all. But I think our culture is maximizing COVID. And we want to be the kind of people who are not afraid of other people. You can minimize your risk of a disease while not being afraid of other people. And the only person who really knows why you're making the choices you make is you whether those are coming from a position of fear or actually just a desire to be reasonable and wise. But we're called in the Bible regularly to open our circle to strangers, to welcome people into our homes who we would not usually welcome into our homes, to be folks who love really, really well in a pandemic. That's a way to finish well. So stand your ground. Stand your ground, and you'll finish well. Nehemiah, by the way, finds out that apparently... This guy has been bribed, which doesn't say great things about his spiritual advisor or whatever relationship this is. And it definitely doesn't say great things about Tobiah and Sambalat. These guys are horrible human beings who also have published an open letter, right? In our time, an open letter is something that happens in the news and you read it, but it's really meant for everyone to read. In their time, it was literally a letter that just doesn't have a seal. So when they say things like, you know, it's said among the nations that you're going to start a revolution and overthrow the king. Well, maybe it wasn't, but now it is, right? Now as people walk around with this letter, everyone's going to hear that. Uh, For me, I would find that relentlessly distracting to know people are talking crap about me. They're dragging my name through the mud would drive me crazy. And for others, that might just be terrifying. But what if they actually managed to succeed? And me and I could just brush it off and say, remember, God, how they acted. I know this is all made up, and I know it's not really going to hurt me. And then he continues. This is verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month in Elul, 52 days. When our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son, Jehonan, had been married to the daughter of Meshullam, son of Berechiah. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So he finishes, and the problems continue. I'm under no illusion that if this season ends, that all of us in life will be perfect. It wasn't perfect before. It's not going to be perfect when the pandemic goes away, whenever that is. There's something to be said for finishing well and then still keeping your eyes on kind of the the long game in the future. You've heard that expression, don't lose the forest for the trees. And we are in a dense clump of trees right now. It's very hard to keep our eyes on the big picture. Yet Nehemiah moves from season to season to season, always doing the next right thing and the next right thing and the next right thing. He finishes well because he has a spirit of stubbornness. Spirit of stubbornness. Now, again, stubbornness can be a bad thing sometimes. But there's such a thing as a holy kind of stubbornness, one that comes from, well, the God that we believe in. Just this relentless resilience, the kind of fortitude, a Christian kind of toughness that gets hit and then keeps going. In the New Testament, there's this book called Revelation, and God sends some letters to the church and some individuals. And in the letters, some of the churches are just asleep and distracted. And the whole message of those letters is, wake up. The enemy doesn't even care about you. You're meaningless in the fight. You have to wake up and actually get engaged. You're barely even following Jesus. But that the churches that are awake, that are following Jesus, 
most of them are being persecuted. And life is really hard. And what he says is, hey, it's good that you're not distracted. You gotta, you gotta stay strong, you gotta stand your ground, you gotta stubborn. You gotta keep going. The way Nehemiah keeps going. No matter what seems to happen, he keeps going. If you remember, right, there were lots of scary moments in this book. There was an actual war at one point in time. He was sleeping on the ground with a sword at his side trying to build a wall. And now, even as it's done, it, things continue to be really frustrating. Tobiah, this guy who's been his enemy from the beginning, is apparently like some kind of clever mob boss, right? Nehemiah's continuing not to be distracted, but many people are. And they're actually starting to believe that maybe Tobiah's not that bad a guy. Or maybe they're so intimidated by him that they're willing to say he's not that bad a guy. And so he says, in my presence, the guy who bribed a religious man earlier in this story, the guy who has been openly threatening me and spreading slander and lies about me, who tried to you know, kill us all at one point in time, they're saying, he's not so bad. I mean, really, if you get to know him. If you, he's not so bad if you get to know him. And again, this for me would drive me crazy. As Nehemiah finds that Tobiah is actually spying on him. And now sending letters to blackmail him and, and intimidate him. It never really stops. And he just keeps going. And the reason he keeps going is he knows the God that he follows. And he's constantly praying to that God all throughout this book. That's this relationship with God that he has. That the spirit of stubbornness comes actually from somewhere else. And that's why we know it's the good kind of stubbornness. The kind that just gets hit in life and, and keeps on going. Back in verse 9 he said, look, they, they tried to distract us so that our, our hands would drop from the work and it wouldn't get accomplished. God, strengthen my hands. And a little bit later, remember, God, what this was. And finally, he's saying, look, verse 15 and 16, 52 days and I finished the wall. 52 days we did it together. It was amazing. And by the way, it was a lul, which you may not know, but that month is right in the middle of summer. So basically what he's saying is, hey, when it was 112 degrees out and you guys were complaining in air-conditioned homes, I was building the wall in rapid time. We got it done in 52 days. It was incredible. And even our enemies said, holy crap, God must be with them. Oh my God, it's God. Unbelievable what God did in and through them. You want to finish well? You want that to be what people say about you? Stay focused. Stand your ground. And you're going to need a spirit of stubbornness, a spirit that doesn't come from you, but from the God of the universe. Now, we've all been to funerals, and some of us have seen people who finish really well. And the stories about them are, yeah, he always had time for his kids. She was always ready to ignore a meeting in order to really love an employee well. You know, it's crazy. All these people were just served by him, and he was a mechanic, and still they wanted to show up. Businessmen and leaders and all these folks. You would think this was a governor's funeral. You've seen people who finish well, and you also know stories of people who haven't. Maybe people who haven't yet died, actually, but their life just seems to be a mess. Maybe because they got distracted along the way, maybe because they got afraid along the way, maybe, maybe because when things got hard, they just quit. But we want to be people who finish well. There's a, a hazard in my profession. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, who are pastors have a strong tendency to explode. I don't know if you've seen this in the news, but there are many of us who go for a while and then have an affair or a huge substance abuse problem or some crazy theft, or some weird anger issue, or they just don't take care of themselves and have a heart attack at a very young age. The list goes on and on and on and on. And as a pastor, this is a really hard thing to watch and to think, is that my future? Is that what's, is that what's coming for me? There's a guy named Billy Graham many, many years ago used to preach a lot of sermons and uh, was known by a lot of folks. And he used to look really paranoid, actually, in the way he would just sort of ignore distractions. And one of the things he loved to do is he would always have a security guard check his hotel room before he stayed in a hotel. He wanted to make sure there was no one in there who wanted to have an affair with him, and no one he'd be tempted to have an affair with, and no one who would accuse him of doing something because the door was closed and there were only the two of us in there. And I think about that commitment to avoiding distraction, even that kind of weird fear of fear. But at the end of his life, nobody ever said bad things about Billy Graham. Finished well. I've known folks in my own personal life who finished well, and I imagine you have. People you look up to and you think, man, if, if I could just make it to the end of my life without destroying myself and actually managing to love people really well, living the kind of life that Jesus talks about, if I could make it to the end of COVID and just think, I haven't wasted six months or six years of my life, 
if I could make it to my kids' teenage years and think, I've, I've actually done a decent job. I didn't check out and look at my phone forever. And I, I was really there and I was present and I was a parent. I want to finish well. There's a, a guy who over the years has massively influenced me and I've never met him. Uh, his name is Clive Charles and he died a long time ago. And he's a massive impact on my life because he was a massive impact on my wife's life. He was her coach in soccer. And he used to impact this group of young women and actually a group of young men because he was a coach of both men's and women's soccer. Just an ordinary guy, soccer coach, not a Fortune 500 leader, not some great pope or nun, just a guy who wanted to coach a soccer team well. And in the midst of all that, he got cancer. And still he made a huge impact on these women and also managed to do some very successful things professionally and do great things in the teams that he was leading. But he made a huge impact on the character of my wife and many others that he led over the years. And when things were hard and he was dying of cancer, he would still take trips across the Atlantic to family back in England, even if it was going to shorten his life, because his goal wasn't to live as long as possible. His goal was to finish well. At the end of his life, there were many who would say that this guy had been an exemplary human being. But this guy had finished well. And there was on the little card at his funeral a verse from 2 Timothy. Some of you know it. It says, I've fought the fight. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. And there is now in front of me a crown that only God can give and no one can take away. He finished well. We can finish well in this season. We can finish well in all seasons. We can finish well. We come to the end of our lives. But to do it, we're going to have to stay focused. We're going to have to stand our ground when the fears threaten us. Anxiety threatens to overwhelm us. We're going to need a spirit of stubbornness that comes not from us, but the Spirit of God, who can help us to fight the good fight and win the race. Keep the faith the one who will one day hand us a crown and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have finished well. Would you pray with me?